said. Sleep no more. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's Tale of Terror told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Armstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. For some reason, which our psychologists probably know all about, there are not many stories by women authors of the type we like to tell on Sleep No More. But tonight, we're going to open with a story by one of our finest women writers, Catherine Ann Porter. From her collection of tales called Flowering Judas, the story is entitled... The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. Doesn't sound much like a ghost story. It's not, Ben. But wait till you hear it. She flicked her wrist nearly out of Dr. Harry's pudgy, careful fingers and pulled the sheet up to her chin. Why, the brat ought to be in knee breeches. Doctor round the country with spectacles on his nose. She said... Now get along, now take your school books and go. Now there's nothing wrong with me. And Dr. Harry spread a warm paw like a cushion on her forehead and said, Now, now, be a good girl. We'll have you up in no time. That's no way to speak to a woman nearly 80 years old just because she's down. I'll have you respect your elders, young man. Well, Missy, excuse me, but I've got to warn you, haven't I? Oh, you're a marvel, but you must be careful. Well, you're going to be good and sorry. Don't you tell me what I'm going to be. I'm on feet now, morally speaking. It's my daughter, Cornelia. I had to go to bed to get rid of her. Her bones felt loose and floated around in her skin. And Dr. Harry floated like a balloon around the foot of the bed. He floated and pulled down his waistcoat and swung his glasses on a cord. Well, stay where you are. Certainly can't hurt you. Now get along and doctor you sick. Leave a well woman alone. I'll call for you when I want you. Now, where were you 40 years ago when I pulled through milk leg and double pneumonia? Well, you weren't even born. And don't let Cornelia lead you on. I pay my own bills and I die. I don't throw my money away on nonsense. She meant to wave goodbye, but it was too much trouble. Her eyes closed of themselves and it was like a dark curtain drawn around the bed. The pillow rose and flowed under her, pleasant as a hammock in a light wind. She listened to the leaves rustling outside the window. No, somebody was swishing newspapers. No, Cornelia and Dr. Harry were whispering together. She leaped broad awake, thinking they were whispering in her ear. Oh, she was never like this, never like this. Well, what can we expect? Yes, 80 years old. Well, and what if she was? She still had ears. It was like Cornelia to whisper around doors. She always kept things secret in such a public way. She was always being tactful and kind... Cornelia was dutiful. That was the trouble with her. Dutiful and good. So good and dutiful, said Granny, that I'd like to spank her. She saw herself spanking Cornelia and making a fine job of it. What did you say, Mother? Granny felt her face tying up in hard knots. Can't a body think I'd like to know? I thought you might want something. I do. I want a lot of things. First off, go away and don't... She lay and drowsed hoping in her sleep that the children would keep out and let her rest a minute. It had been a long day. Well, not that she was tired. There's always so much to be done. Now, let me see. 
tomorrow. Tomorrow is far away and there's nothing to trouble about. Things were finished somehow when the time came. Thank God there was always a little margin left over for peace. And then a person could spread out the plan of life and tuck in the edges orderly. The box in the attic with all those letters tied up, well, he'd have to go through that. Tomorrow. All those letters. George's letters and John's letters and her letters to them both. Lying around for the children to find afterwards made her uneasy. Yes, that would be tomorrow's business. No use to let them know how silly she had been once. While she was rummaging around, she found death in her mind, and it felt clammy and unfamiliar. She had spent so much time preparing for death, there was no need for bringing it up again. Let it take care of itself now. When she was 60, she had felt very old, finished, and went around making farewell trips to see her children and grandchildren with a secret in her mind. This is the very last of your mother, children. And then she made her will and came down with a long fever. That was all. Just a notion like a lot of other things. But it was lucky, too, for she, once and for all, got over the idea of dying for a long time. Now, she couldn't be worried. She hoped she had better sense now. Her father had lived to 102 years old in a drunken noggin of strong hot toddy on his last birthday. He told the reporters it was his daily habit, and he owed his long life to that. He made quite a scandal and was very pleased about it. <laughs> Granny believed she just played Cornelia a little. Cornelia? Cornelia? No footsteps, but a sudden hand on her cheek. Oh, bless you. Where have you been? Here, Mother. Well, Cornelia, I want you nogging a strong hot toddy today. Are you cold, darling? I'm chilly, Cornelia. Lying in bed stops the circulation. I must have told you that a thousand times. Well, she could just hear Cornelia telling her husband that Mother was getting a little childish and they'd have to humor her. The thing that most annoyed her was that Cornelia thought she was deaf, dumb, and blind. Little hasty glances and tiny gestures tossed around her and over her head, saying, Now, don't cross her. Let her have her way. She's 80 years old. And she's sitting there if she lived in a thin glass cage. Sometimes Granny almost made up her mind to pack up and move back to her own house where nobody could remind her every minute that she was old. Wait, wait, Cornelia, till your own children whisper behind your back. In her day, she had kept a better house and she had got more work done. She wasn't too old yet for Lydia to be driving 80 miles for advice when one of the children jumped the track. And Jimmy, he still dropped in and he talked things over, saying, Now, Mammy, you've got a good business head. I want to know what you give this. An old Cornelia couldn't change the furniture around without asking. Little things. Little things. Oh, they'd been so sweet when they were little. Granny wished the old days were back again, with the children young and everything to be done over. It had been a hard pull, but not too much for her. When she thought of all the food she had cooked and all the clothes she had cut and sewed and all the garden she had made, well, the children showed it. There they were, made out of her, and they couldn't get away from it. Sometimes she wanted to see John, her husband, again and point to them and say, Well, didn't do so badly, did I? But that would have to wait. That was for tomorrow. She used to think of him as a grown man, but now all the children were older than their father, and he would be a child beside her if she saw him now. It seemed strange, and there was something wrong in the idea. Why, he couldn't possibly recognize her. She had fenced in a hundred acres once, digging the post holes herself and clamping the wires with just a boy to help. That changed a woman. John would be looking for a young woman with the peaked Spanish comb in her hair and the painted fan. Digging post holes changed a woman. Riding country roads in the winter when women had their babies was another thing. And sitting at nights with sick horses and sick help and sick children and hardly ever losing one. John, I hardly ever lost one of them. John would see that in a minute. That would be something he could understand. She wouldn't have to explain anything. It made her feel like rolling up her sleeves and putting the whole place to rights again. No matter if Cornelia was determined to be everywhere at once, there were a great many things left undone in this place. She would start tomorrow and do them. It was good to be strong enough for everything, even if all you made melted and changed and slipped under your hands so that by the time you finished, you almost forgot what you were working for. What was it I set out to do? 
She asked herself intently, but she could not remember. The pillow rose about her shoulders and pressed against her heart, and the memory was be squeezed out of it. Oh, push down the pillow, somebody. It didn't smother her. She tried to hold it. Such a fresh breeze blowing, and such a green day with no threats in it. She remembered that day she was to marry George, and he had not come. What does a woman do when she has put on the white veil and set out the white cake for a man and he doesn't come? She tried to remember that day was hell. She knew hell when she saw it. For 16 years she had prayed against remembering George and against losing her soul in the deep pit of hell. And now the two things were mingled in one. And the thought of him was a smoky cloud from hell that moved and crept in her head when she had just got rid of Dr. Harry and was trying to rest a minute. Wounded vanity, um, said a sharp voice in the top of her mind. Don't let your wounded vanity get the upper hand of you. There are plenty of girls get jilted. You were jilted, weren't you? Then stand up to it. Her eyelids wavered and let in streamers of blue-gray light like tissue paper over her eyes. <sighs> she must get up and pull the shades down or she'd never sleep. She was in bed again, and the shades were not down. Now, how could that happen? Better turn over. Hide from the light. Sleeping in the light gave you nightmares. Father, how do you feel now? Hmm? Hepsy? George? Lydia? Jimmy? No, Cornelia. And your features were swollen and full of little puddles. Go wash your face, child. You'll look funny. Instead of obeying, Cornelia knelt down and put her head in the pillow... She seemed to be talking, but there was no sound. Well, uh, are you tongue-tied? Whose birthday is it? You going to have a party? Oh, no, Mother. Oh, no. No what, Cornelia? Here's... Here's Dr. Harry. Uh, now, I won't see that boy again. He just left five minutes ago. That was this morning, Mother. It's night now. Here's the nurse. This is Dr. Harry, Granny Weatherall. I never saw you look so young and happy. Well, yes, I'd never be young again. But I'd be happy if they'd let me lie in peace and get rested. She thought she spoke up loudly, but no one answered. A warm wreath on her forehead, a warm bracelet on her wrist, and a breeze went on whispering, trying to tell her something. A shuffle of leaves in the everlasting hand of God. He blew on them, and they danced and rattled. Yes, there was something Granny wanted. She would like again to see George, who jilted her 60 years ago. I want you to find George, Cornelia. Be sure to tell him I forgot him. I want him to know that I had my husband just the same and my children and my house like any other woman. A good house, too, and a good husband that I loved and fine children out of him. Better than I'd hoped for, even. Tell him I was given back everything he took away and more. Oh, no. Oh, God, no, there was something else besides the house and the man and children. Oh, surely they were not all. Her breath crowded down under her ribs and grew into a monstrous, frightening shape with cutting edges. It bored and dead, and the agony was unbelievable. Yes, John, get the doctor now. No more talk. My time has come. When this one was born, it should be the last. It should have been born first, for it was the one she truly wanted. She was strong, and in three days... She would be as well as ever. Better. Mother. Do you hear me? Mother. Father Connolly's here. But, now, I went to Holy Communion only last week, Cornelia, and I tell him I'm not so sinful as all that. Father just wants to speak to you. Well, he could speak as much as he pleased. It was like him to drop in and inquire about her soul as if it were a teething baby and then stay on for a cup of tea and a round of cards and gossip. Granny felt easy about her soul. She had a secret, comfortable understanding with a few favorite saints who cleared a straight road to God for her, all as surely signed and sealed and papers for the new 40 acres, forever, heirs and assigns, forever. So there was nothing to worry about anymore, except sometimes in the night one of the children screamed in a nightmare, and they both hustled out shaking and hunting for the matches and calling, Then now, wait a minute, here we are. John, get the doctor. Hapsy's time is coming. But there was Hepsy standing by the bed in a white cap. 
Cornelia, tell Hepsi to take off her cap. I can't see her plane. Her eyes opened very wide, and the room stood out like a picture she had seen somewhere. The light was blue from Cornelia's silk lampshades. You had to live 40 years with kerosene lamps to appreciate honest electricity. She felt very strong and saw Dr. Harry with a rosy nimbus around him. (laughs) You look like a saint, Dr. Harry. And I vow that's as near as you'll ever come to it. He's saying something. I heard you, Cornelia. Now what's all this carrying on? Cornelia's voice staggered and bumped like a cart in a bad road. Granny put her hand on the bosom of her dress and pulled out a rosary, and Father Connolly murmured Latin in a very solemn voice and tickled her feet. Good Lord, will you stop this nonsense? I'm a married woman. What if George did run away and leave me to face the priest by myself? I found another whole world better. I wouldn't have exchanged my husband for anybody except St. Michael himself, and you may tell him that for me with a thank you in the bargain. Light flashed on her closed eyelids, and a deep roaring shook her. Cornelia, is that lightning? I hear thunder. There's going to be a storm. Uh, Close the windows. Call the children in. Mother, here we are, all of us. Is that you, Hepsy? Oh, no. I'm Lydia. We drove as fast as we could. Their faces drifted above her, drifted away. The rosary fell out of her hands, and Lydia put it back. Jimmy tried to help, and Granny closed two fingers around Jimmy's thumb. Beads wouldn't do. It must be something alive. So, my dear Lord, this is my death, and I wasn't even thinking about it. My children have come to see me die, but I can't. It's not time. I wanted to give Cornelia the amethyst set, and Cornelia, you're to have the amethyst set, but Hapsy's to wear it when she wants, and Dr. Harry, do shut up. Nobody sent for you. Oh, my dear Lord, do wait a minute. I meant to do something about the 40 acres. Jimmy doesn't need it, and Lydia will later on with that worthless husband of hers. And I meant to finish the altar cloth and send six bottles of wine to Sister Borgia for her dyspepsia. Father Connolly, now don't let me forget. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. I, I'm not going, Cornelia. I'm taken by surprise. I can't go. You'll see Hepsy again. Granny made a long journey outward looking for Hepsy. What if I don't find her? What then? Granny's heart sank down and down, and there was no bottom to death. She couldn't come to the end of it. The blue light from Cornelia's lampshade drew into a tiny point in the center of her brain. It flickered and winked like an eye. Quietly it fluttered and dwindled. Granny lay curled down within herself, amazed and watchful, staring at the point of light that was herself. Her body was now only a deeper mass of shadow in an endless darkness, and this darkness would curl around the light and swallow it up. God, give a sign. For the second time, there was no sign. Again, no bridegroom and the priest in the house. She couldn't remember any other sorrow because this grief wiped them all away. Oh, no, there's nothing more cruel than this. I'll never forgive it. She stretched herself with a deep breath and blew out the light. and touching stories, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, from Flowering Judas and Other Stories by Catherine Ann Porter, published by Harkett Brace and Company. Now here is Nelson Armstead to introduce our second story for tonight. Mr. Armstead? As a change of pace, Ben, I have a little shocker here by Paul Ernst. It's a weird tale of a madman who knew many strange things, and it's called Escape. He had the oddest form of insanity I've ever seen. Of course, I hasten to add, I hadn't seen much. Oh, I'd been through an asylum once before, as now, to a story for my paper on treatment and conditions of state inmates, and that was all. On that former trip, I'd witnessed nothing like this, nor had I, till now, on this trip. The man didn't look insane. So often they don't. He was a medium-sized cap with gray in his hair and a look of sadness on his thin, mild face. A look of sadness and mm, determination. Neatly dressed, precise of movement, he was very busy in his cell. He paid no attention for a while as the guard and I stood at the bar door and watched him. He was building something. 
He would pick up a tool, adjust it carefully, work with all the delicacy of a watchmaker for a moment. Then he would lay the tool down and pick up the gauge and check his work, all very accurate and careful. The only thing was that you couldn't see what he was building. And you couldn't see any tools, nor gauges, nor workbench. There was nothing in the cell but the man and a bolted-down cot and chair. Now, he was boring a hole, obviously a very small hole, with a tiny metal drill equipped with an egg-beater handle. Now he was just touching the surface with a file. Now he was sawing something else, after which he took the sawed part from an imaginary workbench and tried it in its place, whatever and wherever that was. Each little period of accurate workmanship ended with a trip four steps to his left to a corner of his cell which was bright with sunlight. It was uncanny. There simply ought to have been something there, a cabinet, a chair, or whatnot, and there wasn't. For the first time acknowledging our presence there, he said, Hello, Nick. Well, hello, said the attendant. Um, meet Mr. Fair, Mr. Gannett. Uh, Mr. Fair's with the newspaper. Oh? Yeah. Uh, how are you doing with your, um, your what's it, Mr. Gannett? Oh, pretty well. This, uh, devil of a floor isn't quite level. It's, uh, three thirty seconds of an inch to a foot off. Yes. I have to allow for that in every line and angle, and it makes it needlessly difficult. Well, what is it you're building? You won't tell any of us, but won't you tell Mr. Fair for his uh, newspaper story? Oh, there it is. See for yourself. Well, as we walked away, I asked the attendant, has he been going through that set of motions very long? Well, started right after he got here. That was a year ago. Oh, some days he works only a few hours, and sometimes all day long, and up until lights out at night. Well, has anybody well, ever felt around that corner where he spends his time? Hey, boy, easy now. Pretty soon we'll be sending wagon for you. Come on, has, has anybody? Well, no. That's the one thing that brings out Gannett's kink. If anybody gets too close to that corner, he gets quite violent. So uh, we don't even clean there. We're trying to cure these folks, not upset them needlessly. All that evening, I kept thinking of that spare, mild-mannered man with the sad, determined eyes after I'd handed my story into the paper. I kept thinking about him next afternoon, and the next afternoon saw me at the asylum again, standing in front of Gannett's barred door. He was busy as he had been yesterday, and as he had done yesterday, he paid no attention to observers at his door at first, but finally he spoke without looking up from his task. Hello, Fair. Hello. You come for another story? Well, in a way. <laughs> I, I don't see how you stand it. Well, who? You. Stand what? Your work. Madness and despair of humanity, that's your stock and trade, no? You deal in war and famine and flood and social injustice and political and civil brutalities. They're the intimate facts of your life. I don't see how you can live among such things. I could even read about them. Well, Mr. Gannon... Whether you face the facts intimately or not, they're still facts and they're still there. You can't avoid them. <laughs> but you can. Yes, at least I can. <laughs> and I'm going to. I'm, I'm getting out of all this. He squatted on his haunches and began running his hands slowly over space, up and down, and then horizontally. He straightened and repeated the process. And I'll swear I, I could make out what he had in his mind. It was a sort of a chair with a very high back and unusually high arms. And just as I had decided this, he sat in it. Now, you've seen clowns sit in chairs with arms folded when there were no chairs to sit in. Well, that was just the same. I gaped at Gannett sitting in thin air. Not an impossible stunt, but always an arresting one. He got up and came to the door. Well, I uh, can't take life as it's lived today, Fear. A weakness, no doubt, but there you are. So I, I'm getting out of it. Oh, no, it's not for nothing that I'm a mathematician and an inventor. No, no, no please. You need not up, Nick. <laughs> I'm not hinting at suicide. It's a more literal escape that I mean. Escape with these barred doors and high walls outside? Oh, walls. Bars. <laughs> Mr. Freer, come back tomorrow. You may have another story. And then he turned his back, thereby dismissing me. I wasn't coming back anymore. I didn't want to see Gannett again. He was such a nice little guy, but... Next, you saw me knocking for admittance a third time, summoned by a call from Nick. Nick said, 
Well, I've uh, got an exclusive for you if you want it, an escape. I don't know that it's very important, but we've never had one before. That might make it worth a couple of inches. An escape? Yeah, your man got it. So he did it. But how? Well, suppose you tell me. In the night? No. A little while ago, in broad daylight, he was seen in his cell at ten. An hour later, the room was empty. He was gone. But he couldn't have simply walked out of the place in broad daylight. No, he couldn't. Was his door unlocked? It was not. It was locked from the outside. When we came to investigate the report that he was gone. His window bar's all right, too. You've uh, searched the grounds. Of course. He isn't in them. He isn't in any of the buildings. Nobody saw him after 11 o'clock. He's just gone with his cell still locked so even a monkey couldn't slip out. But you must have some idea how he got away. No idea, no. Because it can't be done. Only it was. Well, now look, how am I going to get a story out of that? Well, how in thunder would I know? That's your worry. Well, Nick, look, what in the world do you suppose he, uh, well, thought he was building? I don't suppose anything about it. If I did, I'd be as bad off as he was. Well, there's your exclusive if you know what to do with it. John, well, nobody ever saw Gannett again. Nobody ever thought of him again, I guess. Except me. I had a rash of curiosity a few days later and went to a cell armed with a level and a steel rule. The floor of the barred cubicle Gannett once occupied is three thirty seconds of an inch to the foot off level. Now, how do you suppose he could have determined that without tools of any kind to aid the naked eye? can turn up the light now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right. Isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Olmstead, and tell us about next week's story. Ben, next week I plan to offer two particularly good stories. Banco's Chair by Rupert Croft Cook is the story of a detective who calls upon a ghost to help him solve a murder. However, it turns out to be an eerie experience for everyone. The second is by Guida Mopasaw, entitled A Coward. Don't have to be with us next week. <laughs> <laughs>